All right, hey, I'm, I'm Dave. I think I've probably met or talked to probably at least a quarter of you at some point. Um, I work on a G-processing analysis team. I've been working for Esri for about 14 years. I do a lot of Python, a lot of documentation, a lot of geoprocessing. This is kind of a, a session that focuses largely on the ArcPy data access module. Um, that's the kind of wordy thing you'd see in the agenda. It's more or less kind of that module plus a few other pieces that kind of fit and flow with that. Um, really, we want to break this out. Really, what we're going to talk about mostly is uh, cursors, dealing with uh, you know edit sessions, how to kind of handle that, control that. Um, talk a bit about sort of some interplay with some third-party libraries that impacts our stuff, and really some scenarios and ways of dealing with kind of accessing data. So this is kind of a yeah, like a guided tour, basically, of the ArcPy data access module. So first up is cursors. So cursors are really just kind of fundamental building block for a lot of workflows that we'll need to do. You know, I have kind of this geoprocessing orientation. Geoprocessing, you kind of think of as like, well, you have this big chunk of data, throw it at some tool, right, and you get something back. Cursors are more about kind of getting into the, the individual rows the individual features and kind of pulling out or, you know, changing or adding new features and attributes. We have uh, two kind of uh, implementations of the cursors. If you looking back kind of maybe some older code, you'll see some of the, what we call like the classic cursors. This is stuff that was right under the, the ArcPy namespace. If you have anything there, I would just say, you know, you can leave it, but I would generally suggest remit I would generally recommend using the ArcPy data access cursor. The whole motivation and the reason for we even did it was for performance. So if performance matters, and yes, it usually does, right, we'll just stick with the data access one. All right, so the general kind of workflow or the flow of cursors are index-based, right? So we pass in, you know, pass in you know, fields, and then in this case right here, the number one will go to the field one, right? The number 10 will go to the field two. This kind of contrasts with what we had for the old classic cursors, which was much more kind of this heavy um, row object orientation. You have to create a row, you stuff the values in, and you pass that in. You know, that object, you know, using the row object and this kind of implementation of that really kind of bog things down. So, We'll leave that mostly aside and we'll focus on the data access versions. So a lot of times when you see cursors being used, especially the data access one, you're gonna see them kind of in this sort of context with a with statement. Now, if you're not familiar with with statements, it's something in Python, I think they added it in, what, a 2.4, 2.6? I think, yeah, it's pretty recent. Well, yeah. somewhat recent. Yeah. It, uh, sort of provides a sense of what we call context management. So when you have something in the with statement, kind of re what happens in that will kind of, there's certain behaviors that will come out of it for you, right? So in this case, with the with statement, you know, if it just sails through completely, or in this case, even if it fails, you know, there's certain behaviors that we can expect, right? Like, I have a little asterisk on this, but locks are taken care of for you. You don't have to worry so much about deleting cursor objects. Um, you know, there's some other benefits, like you're allowed to, you know, make multiple edits on tables in the same workspace. Now, the reason that the asterisk is there, it doesn't cover every locking case. You'll find, especially if you're, well, say you're working on a cursor and you got, you know, your IDE up, and you're dealing with that same data in the map, you're still potentially gonna hit a lock there even if you use the cursor in the with statement. So just kind of a caveat there. Now, the overriding kind of goal for the data access cursors was performance. And some of that's, you know, things we did, but there's also some things that you can get out of that yourself. So generally speaking, we suggest like you only use the fields that you need, all right? We can have tables for each class that have in 100 fields, right? Only get what you need. Now, one little catch is, you know, you can use the star to get all your fields. So if you do that, right, you're really just using the field names as they are. 
So for geometry, right, geometry fields typically just called shape, right? So if you specify it through the star or you specify it directly, you get this token behavior over here, this shape at x, y. This can throw people sometimes. What you're, you normally would probably be expecting there is a geometry object, but instead you're gonna get a tuple, okay? Now, these tokens in general are kind of meant to be kind of as a shorthand, right? So instead of asking the cursor for, you know, your full geometry, what you can do is you can say, okay, well, I only really want, you know, the length of the feature, or I only want, you know, the centroid or something like that. Use just those tokens in place of a field name, and it'll give you just that information. Probably the heaviest thing you can do in a cursor is actually getting the full geometry. So anytime you could avoid that, you know, I would definitely suggest it. Now, there's different ways of kind of passing in, creating geometry. Now, the, this classic sample kind of here is kind of the, more the old school way of doing it. We have a very kind of heavy sense of like geometry objects. So if you wanted to create, like in this case, this is a two point line, right? You got to create a couple points, you know, that goes into a list, that goes into an array, that goes into the geometry constructor along with spatial reference, right? That's a very kind of, well, it's kind of obtuse and a lot of objects and it's really not that efficient. So if you're passing stuff in, you can do things like this instead, right? Um, JSON is essentially just a dictionary, right? So you create a dictionary format kind of in this Esri JSON style, make that into a, a pass it into JSON loads, and then you pass that in directly. Now another way, maybe not that obvious, and I don't think we document this particularly well, but you can pass in just like a list of coordinates when you're constructing geometry through a cursor. You can't, this is not like creating a geometry object, this is like creating the coordinates that you'll then put in, right? So this is the same scenario as the previous two, right? So we just have a a list with a couple tuples in it that have the XY coordinates and that's all we need to do. Um, I don't know if you show this, but I have an example later that where it's very uh, convenient to do it this way instead of going through some kind of weird intermediate process, right? Just use the coordinates directly. Right. All right, so I'm gonna be doing the demos for you guys today. So just showing some of the concepts that Dave goes over. Um, basically showing that functionality in action. All the code I'm going to be showing you guys today is at this URL. So there's a GitHub repo online um, that contains every single code snippet I'm going to be showing you guys. So instead of you know writing down the, these codes frantically and on a piece of paper, just kind of take it in and, and reference this uh, this URL at, at a later time. Um, here's the Here's the repo, it's on just a open source GitHub uh, page and demos, <coughs> scripts are all on there. Every uh, demo I'm gonna do, uh, the start of it has, has some reference to online help as well. So we have detailed technical doc on every piece of, every function, every class that we're gonna talk about today. Really every function and class that are exposed through the ArcPy API. If you wanna do some reading, um, the, if you're on desktop 10.5, the place you'd go is under Analyze. There's a Python book as well as an ArcPy book for more. The Python is more sort of a high level kind of uh, technical things. ArcPy is really documenting the, our, our library, our API. Actually, Dave wrote much of this uh, documentation for you guys. Um, all right, so let me just take you through a story here, maybe some, some data cleanup. So I found some data online, and again, this is all in the and on the GitHub repo, how to get the, the data into the state. So I have some data I downloaded from online. I have just counties uh, data from Costa Rica. It's called Canton, which is uh, counties basically. And uh, I want to do some population density study on this data. So I went to Wikipedia and found the, the population by counties and basically merged it. And I got this output. But as is often the case, um, my joins weren't complete, uh, completely successful. I have two counties that don't have any population information. So there was the join, basically didn't join every record. There's two of them that have no population data. So 
you know, how do we go about cleaning up this data? I'm gonna take you through a process using cursors. And again, you know, this is fairly simplistic. There's only two missing records. I could probably clean them up by hand, but just extrapolate for yourself. You know, if you had hundreds or thousands of records you have to clean up, maybe it wouldn't be trivial. But again, so this is the case. I'm gonna go about uh, doing some data cleanup uh, with this data. So cursors, as Dave said, is a real fundamental building block of, of tools. Actually, we have a thousand geoprocessing tools in our toolboxes. Uh, if you looked at the code internal to many of those tools, there's cursors in there, right? Cursors to read the inputs that we're gonna process and cursors also to write or update the outputs. So often when people are faced with extending the system with processing or functionality, the, the road, you know, the, the solution lies often in cursors. Um, I'm using an IDE. All the process I'm going to be doing today is an IDE. I'm going to be running against the 10X, 10.5 actually, product. Everything I'm going to be showing you guys also applies to Pro. So the API is quite consistent between these two products. It's not 100%, primarily due to differences in the mapping submodule. Uh, but otherwise, cursors and everything, like I say, everything I'm going to be showing you guys today, I could run it equally well or consistently on Pro or 10X. Um, I have map open, as you can see in my taskbar, it's not necessary, I could just be running a... Yes? It's, it's, oh. it's like we have somebody from the team here. <laughs> Hello, Barbara. <Wrong. laughs> All right, so, um, so here's my script. Um, I'm gonna be running again, you know, every, every code sample you guys, if you download from online, I uh, have links to the online help and, and everything you need. So let me just enable um, a toolbar here real quick, sorry. Debug. So again, I'm using this IDE. Uh, is anybody here using an IDE for Python development? Everybody? Is anybody using PyScriptor? All right. So PyScriptor has been our recommendation for many, many years at the UC and here. There's, for you guys, kind of thinking ahead, PyScriptor is kind of going away, especially when we move to Pro, we actually, it doesn't work well with the Pro Python code base. So the one we'd recommend for you guys to start looking at is PyCharm. I don't know if you have a favorite one outside of PyCharm. Wing yeah, IDE. I usually go PyCharm, yeah. Yeah, PyCharm, Wing IDE. The, the PyScriptor um, IDE didn't keep, keep up with sort of the evolution of the language. Virtual environments have become very, very prevalent and prominent with <laughs> Python. And PyCharm has been kind of, it's a couple years old and there's nobody working on it. So you guys are gonna have to start looking at moving off of that. Like I say, PyCharm, PyCharm is really nice, works well. So we, we'd recommend you guys have a good look at it. All right. so. I think everybody's familiar with IDEs. All I do is I'm gonna run this script. Um, let me clean up some noise. So here's a simple cursor, right? As, as they've said, here's the call to the cursor. I'm saying basically get the county's feature class, which is a table with a bunch of rows in it, right? Give me the contents of this one record at a time. As they've already covered, there's a context manager, which is basically this with statement, followed by as cursor is context manager. So the, everything that's within this indented block is going to be within this context. And, and upon exiting this context, there's some data cleanup we can do, which is actually keeps your code really simple, like getting rid of intermediate objects, like the row object and, and these kinds of things. So this pattern for doing a cursor is what you're gonna see throughout the doc. Um, and that's the, the recommended sort of way to, to do a cursor. There is actually a real bad pattern I'm doing right now, which is getting star. So this is straight out of the SQL standard. Um, basically get star means give me every single field. It's almost never what you want to do, right? Because you think about having many, many rows, you're probably not going to process every one of them. There's a cost to bring in every one of those rows. So we always recommend just specify which fields you want in your cursor. And the most expensive one, as Dave said already, is the shape field. The shape field is a very large object, potentially when you're talking about polys and points or polys and lines. So, um, let me go back to here. So coming back to my display, I print the set of fields on the cursor because I got star, I actually don't know which order the tuple's coming back in, right? So it's a list of values. The cursor.fields 
property gives me that list, the list of field names basically. But at this point, I'm just gonna step through and get basically the first object, object ID, the value is one, the next value is the shape field, and as Dave pointed out, it's a tuple for, for performance reasons. We don't hand out the full geometry object, and so on. Name is the next value in my list of values. So the cursor let me step through and, and get every row from the table, one, one record at a time. So all I'm doing here is printing it, right? It's very, very simple. You, what you guys can think about is that we actually have a really rich data model for, for interacting with the shape geometry. If I brought the shape in, you know, we can do relational operators and topological operators. We, you can interact with the actual, the other values in this, in this list, right? So you can modify field names, and, or sorry, the, the object, not the object ID, but the, the county name and stuff like that. So again, this is how we implement much of the tools, the geoprocessing tools that are in the toolbox. The th you could recreate the buffer tool, you could recreate select by location, you could recreate a vast set of the tools that we deliver. The thing we always recommend to people is if there's a tool for it though that does what you need, use the tool. Writing your own cursor um, is actually, that's what we do internally, but we have a bunch of optimizations that we do with algorithms and stuff like that. So if you wanted to create your own select by location, well, it's probably going to be slower than our kind of the, the, the tool select by location. Same with buffer. You could write your own buffer. You probably just want to use the buffer tool. So again, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you can recreate a lot of functionality, just you probably don't want to because it, it, may, it probably won't be as fast in every case. So here's another another cursor. This time I'm just gonna say, hey, you know, the here give me the cursor on this same county feature class. This time I just want these two fields. That's all I really care about. I want to get the name and the population. But this time the third parameter on the cursor is uh, a query. So you can do some SQL to say, oh, limit the number of records. Again, that's an optimization, right? I really only care to investigate the two records that didn't get any population information. So um, instead of pulling every one of them across and then doing some, some analysis on it, I can have it happen on the database, limit the set that's coming back from there, and then, you know, perform operations on that. So let me clear my display. So I kind of went quick at the start, but every, th every print statement basically goes into this bottom window. So I'm going to, for every row that came back, there's two of them. So there's two counties that printed to the bottom. So these are the counties um, that didn't have any population information. So how do I go about resolving which ones didn't join, right? I have 82 records in my table I checked, and I have 82 records in my feature class. So let's figure out where they, they, they diverge, right? So I'm gonna pull every single county name from the feature class and put it into this variable. And I'm gonna repeat the process for the table and put them into this tab record. So what this, this is doing is, is basically building two sets, right? So I have a set of name from the table, a set of name for the feature class. And at this point, Python has really nice operators for doing comparison. So there's these things called set operators that Python provides. Python's actually a really nice language for manipulating strings um, and sets of things. So um, all I'm gonna do is basically, let me clear, so again, in the output, I'm gonna print every, every um, county name from the feature class that's not in the table, and then I'm gonna reverse the order and print every, uh, every county in the table that's not in the feature class. So at this point, you can see we have Leon de Cortez, which probably should be mapping to Leon Cortez Castro, right? So it's a, just a naming convention that's slightly different. And these two, this one should be matching to this one, but there's a spelling difference, right? There's an S in Vasquez de Coronado in the, in the, in the feature class, and it's a Z in the, in the table. So at this point, that actually is kind of useful. You know, I, I, I can understand how, um, how these things, what the difference between the two tables, and that's why the, the joins failed. This is a much more kind of complicated set a sequence, so what I'm gonna do, the last step in this process is basically doing an update cursor. So the update cursor is another type of cursor. There, I've been showing you guys so far search cursors that just read from a table. 
There's also an update cursor that reads values, but lets you modify and push them back into the table. So if you guys are familiar with the calc field tool in the toolbox, that's internally what it's doing. It's an update cursor. You specify which field you want to update, and it updates those values. So you can do that yourself with an update cursor. So what I'm doing is I'm pulling across this set of, this set of fields as a list, and I'm going to update it based on a query that I make to basically pull the relevant set of fields and, and push them into the, the Feast class. So I'm kind of going quickly over this, but the gist of it is that with a pair of cursors, I, ran, I already ran this while you guys were, while I was talking, but if I refresh at this point, you guys will notice that these, uh, these counties that didn't have any population information um, now do. So again, you know, this is something you could do manually, but with a bit of code, you know, there's very, very powerful um, kind of processing you can do at a very fine grain level to, to work with your data. All right, Davey. Yeah, so the one thing about the cursors, right, it, it's uh, the indexing kind of is one of the pieces that helps with the performance, but kind of also kind of stinks for code readability. So if you get in that kind of case, you will accept a little bit of a trade-off for performance. You can do something like you see in the bottom, this is really just taking that cursor and, and wrapping it in a little generator function, and then, right, each time that kind of exits out of that generator function, right, it's gonna yield a dictionary. So you're gonna put the field values and the field name together, so then you can access it just using the field name. Now, I don't, do you have any numbers on what the performance loss on that is? I wanna say like 20%, but yeah. I'm not sure that's correct. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. What are we looking so at? it's a trade-off, right? It's a, Right. You want to be able to read your code, right? You either got to leave the, the code comments down or you can do something like this. But just keep that in mind. All right. So now when, you know, we're using edit set, or sorry, when we're using the cursors, you know, insert cursor, update cursor, you know, a number of G processing tools, we're actually making edits on our data, right? And in some places, you know, we just don't want to kind of blindly make all the edits and except what happens, right? We want to have a little bit more control over that process. So this is where the, the editor class comes into play, right? We can, we can run like Jizz had on the update cursor. We can drop that into an editor and then you can kind of make decisions as we go about whether or not we want to commit it and whether we want to discard those changes, um, these kinds of things. Now there are certain actual feature classes, things like, well, feature classes that participate in sort of things, certain things like topologies, geometric networks, where you can't actually make an edit on those without engaging an editor. So just for those cases alone, you're gonna need an editor in certain situations. So the sort of the simplest vanilla case of using the editor is something like this, right? You just drop in the editor in with a with statement, um, just like this, and it will handle all those kind of intermediate editor steps for you. So the start, stop, kind of abort type of calls that you might otherwise make are handled kind of in this context. So the way this would work, you'd start that line, and what that does is going to open an edit session for you and uh, start your edit operation. Now, once you're in here, you know, if it, uh, something fails, right, you get some kind of an exception, um, it's going to abort that operation, and it's just going to close the edit session and kick out any of your changes. However, you know, if it just works, right, sails through successfully, so when it's finished, you know, it exits that with statement, it's going to stop the operation for you and then save and close it. Now, that's not always the case. This is kind of the, the plain vanilla case. There's all these other methods that you can use for, you know, more control. So if you want actual more kind of explicit control on handling these different pieces, you know, all those calls are still there too. So um, if you're familiar with the Eric object side of this stuff, you know, a lot of these calls are the, the basically the same calls that you would make there as well. Are you ready? All right, ready, yeah. ready. Catch an app. All right, here we go.
All right, so as Dave said, there are certain things that you want to, uh, potentially certain groups of functions that you want to use as a, basically group them as a unit, right? So, so you look at this set of calc fields. You know, I wouldn't want to run this into, on production data, you know, and, and leave the data in the state that, oh, if, if it failed on the second or third one, you know, and the script stops, what kind of state is my data in, right? So editor is really nice for, for kind of managing that. It, it lets you group a set of operations and say, okay, either all of them are successful and they get applied to your data, or if any one of them fail, don't apply any of them, right? It's, it's, it's kind of this, this aggregation of, of caching the, the process and, and waiting to know that every operation is going to be successful before you apply it. So um, again, the, uh, at the top of the sample, you're going to see um, relevant documentation. I have a little function here for printing the, the contents of the table to the screen just for you guys so you don't, I don't have to jump back and forth uh, to map. So here I am in my DE, I added some fields and I'm going to start updating the values. Again, this is more my project. Uh, situation. The, the use case that editors for is not so much this interactive working with the data, it'd be more in a production kind of environment where I'm publishing, you know, to, to a database that everybody's using. But anyway, so here's my multiple calc field operations. And first two are success, successful, and then the third one fails. So how I know it fails is because I'm in the try except block, so if any exception are raised, in lines 36, 37, or 38, it goes into this except blocked, uh, which I, all I'm doing currently is just printing the, the error that was raised. So one of my, the, the final, the third, the third calc field failed with this error. So at this point, what kind of state is my data in, right? So I'm gonna use my little function I pointed out already and just point the, the contents of my table to the screen. And all this is is a print statement, a search cursor with a print statement. So as you guys see, it's printing my every record sequentially. I'm looping through it. At some point, it failed. On this line, it failed, and every the, the operation just stopped at this point. So my data is really in a bad state, right? I, I aired out, and, and part of the table is updated. So this is a real bad situation, again, for, for production situation. So how can you deal with it? Um, the editor. So instead of just a try accept statement, I have this uh, context, right? So I'm creating the editor, and every operation within this context is either going to be dealt with as successful and applied, or they'll fail and none of them will be applied. So again, on the third one, there's an exception, the same exception we saw already, which is, you know, an exception occurred. But this time, if I print my counties data, you'll notice that none of the calcs were applied to the data because all three were thrown away because there was an exception in this case. So at least now I know that it's not in this unknown state of, of partially modified. Um, the reason they failed is because I'm trying to put a value that is larger than nine characters into the table. So I fixed it by extending the size of my field. Again, you know, this is a bit of a contrived case. But in this third case, again, with the editor, this time every calc field is successful. And this time, it won't go into the accept block, and the operation will be applied to basically as as the as the cursor exits. Basically, as it does the data cleanup, it swears that there is no exception raised. So the operation, all three operations, are applied to your data. Again, much more of a production sort of um, uh, multi-user database workflow, but but relevant for you guys if you're in, in, if you're in this situation. Right, and that's the editor, Davey. All right, so yeah, so cursors, editors, another big piece of all this is kind of just, you know, really just kind of finding data, cataloging data. You know, a lot of stuff that we, we end up doing is kind of common steps against, you know, sets of, you know, data that's grouped together, right? So. One of the kind of the common patterns that you'll find through an ArcPy is what we call these list functions, right? So some of these are pretty um, straightforward. You know, we have, you know, for instance, under ArcPy, there's, you know, list feature classes, right? It just, 
most of these functions have this kind of common pattern, right? So given some kind of workspace or some kind of data set, you know, it's going to list something about that, right? So um, there's about 30, 35 plus, and you look at ArcPy and all the other modules. Um, today, we're going to kind of focus on some of the ones that are clustered in a data access module. So most of these are actually more specific, not so much to the workspace, but um, actual data itself, right? So like, um, well, that's not entirely true, but more like domains and replicas, you know, these sorts of characteristics. Now, another one that we have, and this is more of a, it's not just working on a simple, you know, one-off kind of workspace like a lot of the other functions do. Walk, when we created this, was kind of mirrored off of uh, os.walk, which is a common kind of Python function that allows you to kind of navigate through a directory or a set of directory, right? You can go through the entire catalog tree and you can search for, you know, whatever file types that you're interested in. Now, we kind of have the same kind of needs, but, you know, walk is working off of just file types, right? You want to find uh, text files, right? CSV files, that's the kind of thing that OSWalk does. You know, we have data types, things like that are in like databases, right? They're not like actual files. So what our DA walk does, you just give it a workspace and then you can give it um, whatever data types you're interested in and it'll catalog essentially that whole thing, right? Step through everything and identify whatever those specific um, data types are. Now, um, see below, I have a couple links if you're interested. There's kind of a, a con contrast of what walk does versus how you might kind of approach it if you weren't using walk. So this one on the bottom kind of tries to cobble together a bunch of those list functions that kind of find all those pieces. And it's a lot heavier, it's a lot kind of awkward dealing with workspaces and switching those kinds of things around. This is a really kind of more straightforward, simple way of getting to data. Essentially, right, you can kind of see this in, in the code sample, right? We're kind of iterating over the initial object and, right, getting the path, the path names, and the data names. Once you get it, you're basically iterating over directories, right, in the first for loop. In the second for loop, you're actually iterating over the contents of each of those directories and workspaces. All right. Are you ready? Yeah. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> All right, so when we started, actually, it's probably around 15 years ago on the whole geoprocessing project, one of the big needs was we had some scripts that at the time were, people were on our 8.2.8.3, and they were working on VBA, hitting the Arc Objects API, and to walk through and find, from a folder, find all the feature classes, all the rasters in their, in their um, directory structure was hundreds and hundreds of lines of code. So that was one of our express goals with the Python API is to have something much, much simpler, much easier to write code against for people that were coming from Arc Info Workstation, you know, to, to be able to be, to write a little bit of code to do a lot of work. So this is what, this is the purpose of walk and, and these various list functions is to do bulk processing, right? All I'm doing in, in many of these examples is just printing values, but you guys can envision, you know, that maybe you'd be doing um, cataloging your, the contents of these folders, right, to, to list every raster and, and print, you know, catalog which spatial reference they have or, or find every feature class in my directories and figure out which ones have geometry errors in them. So you could, like I say, with, with uh, this sort of little bit of code, these 10 lines of code, create something that does a lot of heavy lifting that you could kick off overnight and basically it would walk through, you know, all your data, be it SDE data or you know, basically any geo data that, that we can read, uh, you could use these, these operators for. Again, walk is modeled, as Dave said, after the Python uh, a pattern that was existing in the Python library. OS walk and and what it does is is you specify the the directory you want to let me step to the next end the directory you want you want to start at basically the root where you're going to walk down from and you're going to walk through every single folder you encounter every database every SD connection and what I'm asking for is feature classes in this case 
it could be rasters, it could be, you know, network data sets, whatever it be that you want to look for, um, you know, this is what it will return. Again, this can be costly, but in most cases, the fact that you can accomplish this with very little code is, is worthwhile. Um, in my case, I'm basically walking through, printing the directory. Let me see here. Breakpoint. Taking a little while. I think I restarted it. You read the com out and time sleep for none. <laughs> yeah. All right. So it's walking through. Here's the folders of, that it's discovering. And at this point, it found a feature class. So I'm just printing out the feature class name, right? Hopefully, everybody can see that at the bottom. So it, now it's finding feature classes, printing them to the display window as it discovers them. And again, very simple example, just printing out feature class names, but the ArcPy API has pretty rich functionality for describing the properties of data as well as processing it, right? Every single tool you have in the Arc Toolbox window is a method on the ArcPy library. So there, if there's a tool you're familiar with, like the buffer tool in the Arc Toolbox window, there's a buffer method on ArcPy. Same with all the data management tools, like add fields, you know, delete fields. Everything you can do through tool, tools, you can do it in ArcPy. So again, this, this example is kind of through. I'm just basically printing out a bunch of feature classes. Another really challenging thing that people were doing with ArcObjects many years ago now was managing their domain. So there was some requests from users to basically walk through all my personal geodatabase at the time. And, and figure out which domains were in all of them. So there's a, a, um, there's a list. I'm doing walk again, basically get walking through, and for every MDB I encounter, I'm going to list the domains in that MDB. So every example I've given you guys so far, the list were returning uh, simple strings, right? So I'm just printing the feature class name, you know, and, and that's often the case with GP is that we're string based and it's very, makes for a very simple API and, and gets the job done. Certain things, it doesn't work that well. So when you come to a domain, a domain is actually a more complex object. I could print the, the, the domain name, but really what most people want is, is the additional properties that are on the domain. So I have this little print function here that prints basically the the set of properties. So again, the list domains doesn't return just a string. In this case, it returns an object and that, that object has a set of properties. So one of the properties is the domain name, right? I printed at the bottom. Uh, what type of domain is it? Because there's coded value domains and there's um, range domains. Mm -hmm. Oof, I almost blanked on that one, right? Uh, the field type that this domain is assigned to, which is text fields. And then the key value pairs basically for the code on the coded value domain as well as the description so we can print all those out again so here's the code and the description so this is not a way to to modify the domain how you modify domains is through the there's data management tools to add values to domain and do these kinds of operations this is purely for for querying um, the database's domains so that kind of wraps up that section of the demo. Again, you know, you could use this script to walk through and, and basically build a, a complete catalog of every single domain in use in your various geodatabases. Uh, the last one, and, and this is also a fairly complex object, um, the last one is subtypes. So on a feature class, you could have a subtype. And the subtype is, again, fairly complex, right? You could have a subtype on one field, and it could have... Um, I'm hitting the wrong button. I'm restarting the debugger every time. Um, so the subtype is, again, a complex object, but we have a full way to query and and get the properties of, of the subtypes in new databases, and it's through the list subtypes field, uh, list subtypes function. And again, when it comes to modifying or interacting with them, there's a there's a set of tools in the toolbox to, to modify domain and feature class properties. So again, all I'm doing is printing them here, but 
you get the gist. You know, it's just it's another way to just quickly get properties in data, and then the action you take wouldn't be just printing them. It'd probably be cataloging them or taking some action on them, like uh, with using uh, geoprocessing tools. All right. All right. Yeah. Anyway, four. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So, who's familiar with NumPy? Like, is people using NumPy right now a little bit? All right. So, right, NumPy is this third-party library. It's pretty commonly used for this kind of like heavy, you know, array processing. Right. It's really memory efficient. It works pretty fast. There's a lot of libraries out there that are actually kind of built on top of it and leverage it. Um, Right, and there's some uses where we can kind of play with that a little bit, right? So we have a couple functions, actually several functions that can take the contents of, you know, our kind of tables, G database tables, shape files, whatnot, and convert that over to an array. You can do whatever you need to do over in an array world, and then you can bring it back. Um, we can do that with both tables, feature classes, you can also do that with, with rasters. Now, let's kind of a closer look at this. The, um, the extend table is kind of an interesting one. I kind of abuse this one a little bit. It's kind of a case I have for extend table. Extend table is a good join, right? It takes contents of an array and just drops it on top of feature class or table. What I like to do is, I don't know if you've used the add field tool that much, it's not actually particularly that efficient. So extend table, what I'll do sometimes, I'll create an empty array with I kind of mock it up the way that I want my table to look like and just do an extend table of that empty array onto my table. And then we'll add fields, which kind of can't support everything, but it has a lot of characteristics like, you know, the string field, numeric fields, that sort of thing. And I use that kind of as my cheat. Now, kind of just the simple look at how this works, right? So you take the feature class, lumpy and array, function, you just pass in your feature class and you do the fields, right? It, a lot of the, the arguments for this is actually very similar to what we have with cursors. In fact, kind of the underlying implementation of it is, has a lot of code in common. So once you dump that array into NumPy, right, there's all these NumPy functions that you can just run on it. So this is a kind of a simple one, just the correlation coefficients function. I'm just measuring the, the two columns from my original feature class, right? You know, of course, once you're on the NumPy side, you can, you can bring that stuff back in. Now, normally, you're not going to kind of construct an array like this. It's kind of showing you the kind of structure your array would have when you're passing it in. So in this case, you can see the coordinates are kind of in a tuple in their own column. You know, you could format this in a number of different ways, but However your array is constructed, however the coordinates might be arranged, you can pass that over. Now, when we think of a, like a NumPy array, it doesn't relate very closely to how, I mean, it does relate closely like rasters and to points, but more, you know, not complex geometry, but lines and polygons, right, have, you know, typically, well, mul multiple coordinates, right? That kind of structure doesn't fit into a nice kind of, structured NumPy array where we have kind of fixed memory allocation. So if you ever have a NumPy array that kind of does represent table or feature class, sorry, uh, like a polygon feature class or a polyline feature class, you're going to have typically like, like an icommon ID and then coordinates will be listed downward. So I wrote this function actually a couple years ago and it's online here if you're interested. It's kind of a way of, of taking um, a NumPy array and kind of managing that. Now, the one thing, the reason I kind of got into that geometry creation early on with the cursors, is kind of this little bit of code right here. We see this coming in here and this A, just an array, right? And the, the D type for the NumPy array has this geometry fields. Column. Well, I can just, what that was, which is really just a set of coordinates, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I just dump that into a list and then I push it right back in. I don't have to kind of go through this intermediate, you know, geometry object creation. I can just pass in a list directly. 
So I find myself more and more, I'm kind of getting into cases like this where I'm kind of mixing my, my cursor use with NumPy, where I can't quite get everything I want to do in the cursor world, so I dump it into an array, do some manipulations, and then do some analysis on it, and then kind of bring that back over. Now, Pandas is kind of another common library that we use, and we added this into most of the products at 10.4, and then it went into the ArcGIS Pro kind of, well, you can see the comment there, between 1.0 and 1.1. It's a, another kind of library that kind of sits on top of NumPy Arrays to a large degree, and it's really kind of handy for um, manipulating tables, kind of getting information at things that way. It's actually kind of based off of, um, oh, what's it? I can't remember what I was thinking, but it, it's, it's kind of a very um, powerful and kind of commonly used library. So we don't have functions, at least at this point, that allow you to take like our data and push it directly into a pandas data frame, but you can kind of use that feature class, the numpy type functions kind of as the intermediate stage, right? So you can see in this a little bit right at the top, you know, it's really kind of just one intermediate step. I take the my feature class, I dump it into a NumPy array, and then I just pass that directly to the pandas data frame, and then you know I can do whatever I want on the pandas side. Kind of similarly, if you want to go the other way, that's possible too, right? It's basically, again, kind of using the NumPy array to feature class as kind of my intermediate stage there, right? So I have a pandas data frame, put it into the NumPy array, and then I can push that back into a table on my side. Kind of a way of balancing those really three libraries, right? ArcPy, NumPy, and, and Pandas. All right. All right, so as Dave says, NumPy is really the, one of the real foundational libraries of, of scientific computing in Python. It's very, very good at number crunching. It creates these, these uh, contiguous homogeneous arrays of numeric values and performs really quick math on them, right? So for my example, I'm still using the, the county's data um, for Costa Rica. Clearly, I could just do this with a Python list, you know, 82 values, that's no big deal, I could do that. When you're getting into large numbers of, of values, then NumPy becomes really interesting, and it's, like I said, the, the performance is, becomes really worthwhile. Um, as Dave said, the, the NumPy, uh, table to NumPy array is how you get data from a table into NumPy array. There's also, we have a number of other conversion functions to get rasters into NumPy arrays as well as feature classes into NumPy arrays. Um, and they have consistent signature with the cursors. In this case, I'm just specifying the counties. I'm going to export counties to NumPy array and just this population field. I could the I could specify query if I wanted to subset you know the the set of records I want to export. In this case, I'm just going to push everything into there, and the re return value is an array. Uh, and at this point, I can see that there's 81. The length of the array is 81. I can print it. This is a mul NumPy is a multi-dimensional array, so you can see that there's all these values. They happen to have a single value in each one of the cells. You know, it could be multi-dimensional, so it could be multiple. Uh, values in it if I specify multiple fields. They're homogeneous types, so every single value, every single value in my array is of one type. The NumPy has some notation for this, which would be kind of familiar with uh, for CS people. So at this point, uh, NumPy lets me do, like I said, these fast calculations, like what's the sum of all these values inside my array? Well, the sum is 4,000. Um, I can get the standard deviation, min, max, these kinds of things that everybody needs to do, right? So um, here's an example of multi-dimension. So if I specify multiple fields when I'm generating the array, what I get is an array of, of many values, right? So there's four values in every cell. And again, I could do all kinds of slicing and you know conversions and, and look for relationships between these, um, these arrays. Um, you can also do some pretty cool things like just calculations between one dimension and another. Um, pandas 
builds on top of NumPy. So Pandas is actually sitting on top of the NumPy structure for doing it, much of its calculations. So how you generate a Pandas data frame is through basically this, this function right here. You just pass in the NumPy array into the data frame. So we, uh, at that point, you know, you get all this, this Pandas stuff. Really Pandas is a, is a bit of a more SQL-y feeling syntax than, than NumPy. NumPy is very math kind of centric. Um, Pandas builds on that, but adds certain structures that are basically familiar with people come from, from SQL. So they have nice uh, formatting, they have sort and group by, and some, some shortcuts like head, which is basically the first uh, five values. So it just adds a bit of nice syntax to it that lets you work more, more nicely with these arrays. Uh, I think most people at this point are, are, would lean towards using um, pandas as, a, as a, just a more friendly uh, structure than numpy arrays. But again, if you're familiar with numpy already, uh, it's, a good, it's a good option. So here's another real nice thing that would not be trivial to do in numpy is group by. So I wanna sum the population uh, based on my provinces, which are you know aggregation unit of the counties, and summarize these. So again, very very simple syntax. You know, it lets you do some nice things. If you happen to be in a in a notebook, you can. There's a bunch of visualization that kicks in as well with pandas, so they have ways to to display themselves nicely in a notebook. So um, the trick with NumPy is that we have exporters from our geo data and we have importers as, as they've covered. So you can turn a NumPy array into a raster or a table or feature class or extend an existing table with a NumPy array, which is basically a join. Um, when it comes to pandas, pandas is a different thing. You'd have to get it, bring the, the data frame of pandas back into a NumPy array in order to bring it back into our system. But uh, again, it's probably worthwhile just from the nicety of the API and, and the functionality it delivers. All right. Yeah. Cool. The uh, the one thing that I, I have to remind myself when I'm dealing with the NumPy arrays is um, you're dealing with text fields, and I sometimes burn myself on this. Is when we push uh, text fields over to a NumPy array, right? You got it's going to go over in Unicode, so it's going to be two bytes per character, right? You send over a text field that's you know got a width of a hundred, and you got million features, right? You can burn through a lot of memory pretty quickly. So when I get into a situation where I do with text fields, I kind of end up trying to chunk it up a bit more, like do it by kind of unique values or things like that. But um, I've got a lot of use at NumPy for my, my own stuff as well. All right, that kind of draws us to a close. Um, you've seen the survey things already, appreciate your feedback, you know, helps us guide us in future years and future conferences for the kind of topics that we discuss. But um, otherwise, thank you. We'll, we'll stick around if you guys have any questions. Yeah. Okay. Hey, do, you want, do, you want take, do you want to take open questions or? We, we got enough time to take a couple questions if there's broad. Yeah, let's yeah, see that sure. for a few minutes. Does Panda support joins? Yeah, I think it's a kind of a, like I say, it's really modeled after SQL. I think that's a kind of a prime yeah, once you have two data frames, yeah, the, I, I'm, I'm sure there's a, there's a join option on those. Have to look, like say, just Google Panda joins, you're gonna hit you know, the, the syntax for it, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. More questions? Yep. So you're, you're processing a million records and you're trying to figure out where the breaking point between a cursor and a kind of a numpy approach to... Uh, I'm more or less the, edit, edit, um, the editor? Yeah, the editor. Right. Mm. Right. So the, it's caching it, you know, it's the same uh, architecture that's used by the application. You know, when you're when you start editing, all these things get cached, you know, locally, and then they get pushed on on exit or on save, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, no, I think it's a file on disk. 
you know, we, yeah, we have enough memory limitations. All that stuff is cached in a temporary kind of location. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I don't know that you're going to get a lot of performance difference, you know? I haven't actually looked into, you know, where, how much of an overhead that would be. You know, but that is the, the gain there is purely for managing your operation, right? So if you're not, if you're in that situation of a multi-user database, you know, managing that is probably something you need to do anyways. You know, it's, mm -hmm. so I don't think the cost, it's not so much about the cost, it's just your, your workflow, do you need to do that or not? More questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So the question is about uh, the packages we showed today and the demos, are they available through Anaconda? Uh, yeah. Right, so the, the store with Conda Anaconda, so for ArcPy, ArcPy comes with the product. So you install Pro or you install ArcMap and you get ArcPy. It's not something you can Conda install or pip install. It has a dependency on the desktop product that delivers, it's also in, in, in included in server. The Conda is included in Pro now, but that's purely as a way to help you manage um, other packages. So if you want to install scikit-learn, you just go to the back lot on Pro and you say install scikit-learn. So we're mm -hmm. leveraging Conda to make sure that you can install these other packages mm -hmm. and there's no conflict with our existing set because everybody's using NumPy. Right, so the trouble people are get into at 10x is they want to use scikit-learn. So they go get scikit-learn, they install it, and it updates NumPy because the version of scikit-learn you installed was needed that version of NumPy, and now ArcPy doesn't start because we're linking against a particular version of NumPy. You know, so Conda, that's one of the express purposes of Conda is to manage these dependencies and make sure that everything is working nice together. So it's in pro, uh, it's not currently in 10, so in 10 you just have to be cautious and figure out, you know, your version dependency, mm. right? Any more? We'll stick around if you guys want to come up, if you have more questions. Yeah, we'll stay here as long as you want, so All right. come on down. <laughs>